before this video starts, I just want to say thank you guys for 50k. I'm very thankful for the fact that you guys are subscribed. Even if you're not subscribed and you enjoy the content, it's all good. I'm just glad someone enjoys my content at the end of the day. That's what I'm saying. I'm more motivated as evident by this video. I mean, I thought I was never going to upload this. Well, here it is. So yeah, more stuff will come, you know, tough enough. Kurt Angle and TNA, we're going to continue that story. I think we're due for another year review. I haven't made those in about five months, so expect one of those in the coming days or weeks i got a bunch of ideas in my mind that we'll hopefully make in the future so yeah by the way the next video will be alberto del rio and santa claus so yeah right now let's get into the video what is up guys wrestling premiere is here all right it's time i've saved this for a very long time and i have to do it justice for good and for bad i'm not making the video because i want it to be an hour it's because of the fact the content itself will force it to be that long are more of these types of videos coming? Hell yeah, I want to do something on Taker's WrestleMania streak. I want to remake the entire Evolution series because the damn dialogue sucks and so does the whole videos. Something about Flair's 16 title reigns and possibly CM Punk's also. Just a note though, if I do go through with it, it will include some past videos such as the Y2J feud and the whole AJ Lee thing. But yes, if necessary, long videos will be made. With that said, this title reign is hated and absolutely despised by some. Why is that? Why in the hell are they going to hate a John Cena title reign? I mean, it's obvious because they wanted change. The fans seen enough of John Cena. He was overexposed, winning every match he's in, and this took a toll on some in the audience. On the other side, some love this title reign because Cena showed he can lead the company. The complaints many had about his in-ring talents were silenced throughout late 2006 and 2007. I mean, in my opinion, you can't say someone's a bad wrestler if they drag the great Kali to a decent match. Sure, he may have not been the best in the company, but in this run, he became a leader. He gave Umaga and Bobby Lashley their best matches up to this point, too. And overall, it was certainly memorable. My personal opinion on the run is, had Cena never held the title for so damn long earlier... It would have been even more appreciated, but yes, regardless, it has to be his best year. I mean, following 07, Cena's performances were as consistent as they were from the 380-day title reign. 2010 and 2015 might have a shout-out as his best years following his title reign. That could be your opinion, so yeah. Anyways, let's get into this very controversial run. At this point, John Cena really improved as an in-ring performer. His days being carried to decent matches by the top guys was slowly fading away. It's like the moment he wore the camel shorts, everything changed. As for how he won the title, he FU'd Edge off a 20-foot ladder through two tables. He retrieved that belt at Unforgiven 2006. Now, rumor has it Cena was ready to go to SmackDown Pro the pre-match stipulation. He really wanted to go and turn heel. But Vince, who I assume, for business reasons, turned down Cena's request and so he remained on Raw. As for why Cena looked so disappointed after the match, I believe it was because he basically killed Edge to win the title. Not because of the SmackDown move being vetoed. That's just a rumor a bunch of fans said. Yeah, that's what I think, because he had to nearly kill the guy in order to win the title. The next night on Raw in Montreal, Cena spoke about his title victory. As expected, the champ received a mixed response, mostly negative from the Montreal faithful. Jerry Lawler cited Canada as Bizarro Land due to the reception Cena received. And I don't think it's Bizarro Land, they just didn't like the guy. The fans were so damn loud, for good and for bad. And Cena had yet to utter a single word, but they were still booing and cheering. The new champion proclaimed himself the champ once again as the Montreal crowd continued booing. A limping rated R superstar interrupted and he received a positive reception. He called Cena's victory unforgiven a fluke and Cena showed respect to the rated R superstar before giving the former champion two options. Option A, option one. Go screw himself or two, fight like a man. Edge, though, he wasn't feeling a title match in Canada. As a matter of fact, he believed Montreal isn't in Canada. It's the inbred brother of Canada's Montreal. They booed. The crowd turned on Edge, and at this point, there was nobody to cheer for. He continued insulting the crowd before promising to take back the title, but not tonight. John was annoyed over the fact that Edge was still whining about how he took punishment. Oh, I went through two tables, wah, wah, wah. And he wanted to know, like, why in the hell is Edge out here if he's not fighting? Well, he wanted payback for the TLC match. He lost right in front of his mother sitting in the second row, and he lost the most important thing, his WWE Championship. Edge goaded Cena into a fight, and out came Caden Murdoch. They whooped his ass like a government mule, and this led to DX making this safe so it was once again your favorite match it was a six-man tag team match you know it jonathan coachman came out and booked the main event the good guys got one over the heels and stood tough to end the night seriously though i'm fed up with six-man tag matches the following week though things went south for the wwe champion first of all cena was booked to face lita in a match with one arm tied behind his back why was this match made well edge goaded cena into it obviously lita lost due to edge not being able to interfere but that's not the point though after the match king booker and his loyal subjects from smackdown came out they forced cena to kiss the king's foot and after the assault, Edge had a big smile on his face. Since Cena was very vulnerable, and since he was going to appear on SmackDown later that week, this was the perfect time for Edge to invoke the rematch clause. So he did. 
next week on Raw was going to be John Cena versus Edge in a steel cage match for the WWE Championship. There's a reason why they call him the ultimate opportunist. It's clear. I mean, this is why. As for Friday night, it was the first time Cena appeared on SmackDown since June of 2005. He teamed up with Batista and Bobby Lashley to face King Booker and his loyal subjects. Throughout the match, the heels isolated the injured left shoulder, but once he got to tag in Lashley, they ended up winning. Right after the match, though, Edge from out of nowhere speared the hell out of Cena. As for the title match on Raw, John Cena was at a complete disadvantage, but luck was on his side. Lita, who was helping Edge, got ejected. The ref then got knocked down. The chair that was brought in was Edge's wrongdoing, and it was time for the STFU. But Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch ran in there, kind of high load Cena, kind of. They tried reviving Edge and pulled him to the outside, but DX crashed the party and the whole thing was flipped on its head. Shawn Michaels hit the switch in music on Murdoch, who bounced the door right into Edge's face and basically cost him the WWE Championship. So now the champ is off to new challenge. Before he can face anyone for the title, however, he was looking to become the champion of champions. That's how Vince says it. On the season premiere episode of Raw, John Cena kicked off the show. So he's just vibing, discussing the new edition of Raw when King Booker interrupted. Booker took offense to Cena's catchphrase, you know, the champ, but he did, however, acknowledge Cena as a champion before calling himself the champ. So, like, you may be the champ, but I mean the champ, you know. Booker gave Cena a little flashback to the last time they met on Raw, and Le Champion mocked the king with an accent. He reverted to his normal self before challenging the king to a fight. Then the Big Show appeared. He called himself the champion of champions, he insulted both men, and the Big Show put himself over as the most dominant athlete ever. To which Cena acknowledged Andre. Big Show said that he's heard a lot about Andre, and if Andre was here, he would kick his ass. In order to prove his point, he mentioned the movies, his cameo in The Waterboy, and how he did all of those scenes in one take. If you watch The Waterboy, you've seen Captain Insane, alright? I mean, he's all over the movie. <laughs> Booker responded stating that show was in the movie for no more than 42 seconds and he said that if you want to see champions that define cinema, you should check out Ready to Rumble. That is in the upper echelon. It's the elite of the elite movies that you will ever see. The other two made fun of him before Cena focused on the topic. He attacked Big Show and initiated a brawl. Since all three champions claimed to be the best, Mr. McMahon had the idea of pitting Raw's champion against the champion of ECW against the champion of SmackDown in order to determine just who will be the champion of champions. That's how he says it. He's crazy. Later that night, for the first time since Cena's been a world champion, he got the chance to face The Undertaker in the main event. Looking back on this match, if there was a perfect time to have this thing go down, I think it could have been WrestleMania 23, but it doesn't really matter because both guys went on to have classics anyway, so yeah. But it, it is a missed opportunity if you look at it that way. The match itself wasn't really anything as it didn't even last 5 minutes. The other champions interfered, Mr. Kennedy attacked Taker and Cena managed to stand tall by the end of this thing. The next week though, Cena met Kevin Federline. So on the October 16th, 2006 episode of Raw, Johnny Nitro and Melina promised an A-lister will appear on the show. What they didn't tell us was that k was A-list by proxy. I mean, what's so A-list about him? I would tell you who k is for those of you that don't know, but I'll leave us in the whole other topic. But long story short, he was married to Britney Spears at the time, and in entertainment, he was the biggest heel in America. The guy garnered heat upon entering the ring, anything he says they would boo him, and he said that the same people booing him are the same people buying magazines with his face on the front cover. Yeah, I'm sure they did. He also called the LA fans a bunch of superficial posers. Melina then asked k Fed to debut a song from his album, the fans were like, hell no, and with good reason. I mean, if you've listened to those songs, good god. The funny part in this is the fact that the fans didn't want to hear it, yet he's telling them to wait a week. I don't think they would wait an eternity for that album. That's one thing for sure. Then the champ interrupted. Cena wanted to rap himself, and I should know he hadn't rapped in about a year at this point. The rap was a way to mock K-Fed. He mentioned how K-Fed's fame and fortune is built in and how he's got less talent than Paris Hilton. Before stating, Johnny Nitro doesn't have the nuts to hit him. And then, this is the most famous part. This is the part I will always remember. If K-Fed wasn't around, I'd be spearing Brady. Melina gasped, the fans cheered, and for some reason... Johnny tried to make the save. He got tossed out of there, but then Mafia boss Big Show and King Booker came out. Vince ran in there and announced that one of the three world championships will be defended at that pay-per-view. You know, Cyber Sunday. He gave the choice to the fans and left. This meant Cena and K-Fed were alone in the middle of the ring, and the fans loudly chanted, Cena, Cena. 
And he acknowledges K-Fed's presence. He wanted Federline's influence seeing as he claims, Oh, the people do what I want to do because I'm a trendsetter. Kevin wanted Cena's title to be defended at the pay-per-view, and it was a tough pill to swallow, but Cena, you know what he did? He decided to screw and he F-U'd Kevin Federline. By the way, uh, Cena lost control. I'm sorry, nobody will get that one because nobody bought a CD, but yeah. The following week, America's Most Hated once again made an appearance. This time though, for dumb reasons. He decides to slap Cena, but luckily Johnny quickly made the save. It was during the match between Cena and Nitro. The faux Marine bounced back by bouncing Nitro with an FU to win the match. K-Fed wasn't really keen to fight, but Cena's mindset was otherwise. Luckily, Big Show and King Booker attacked, and they hit their finishers while Mr. Spears watched on. Booker, though, capitalized on the distracted Big Show and ended up being the last man standing. I should note that Federline was absolutely hated. He's shouting Cena sucks, and the fans were responding with you suck. That's how bad it was for him. Or good, depends on what you think. On the triple threat match, Cena first of all trashed K-Fed's album calling it a literal bomb. He didn't care whether or not his title was on the line or not, and how it's in the fans' hands, you know, it's all your choice, whatever. He asked Todd Grisham about who he voted for, and the guy was scared to reveal the information. Cena got him to reach his breaking point, when he shouted that his choice was King Booker. He also hoped that Cena gets his ass beat, and thus, Lunatic Cena was unlocked. He shouted about how King Booker and Big Show will be staring into a loaded gun. I don't think we need to continue that. Anyways, about the main event, the fans voted for the coach. He obviously got his ass beat and Cena stood tall. Anyways, now the match at Cyrus Sunday was decent. I don't think it was the best match. It was good though. Beforehand, Booker made a peace treaty with Cena and even offered his wife for one night in exchange for that deal. Cena sarcastically accepted, but only wanted to prove a point, you know, King Booker will do anything. He'll even offer his wife for a little advantage. With that said, the fans chose King Booker's World Heavyweight Championship in a landslide vote. Unfortunately, though, it basically spoiled the results because there was no way, there was no way in hell that SmackDown was going to be left without a champion. But for me back then, everything was unpredictable, you know. When you're a kid, you're watching wrestling, you're like, huh, anything can happen. Cena and Booker mostly went back and forth, and the Big Show was on the outside. At one point, Cena had the match won, but Charmel interfered. She got a feud, Booker ran into the SCFU himself, and it was all but over. But, Kevin Federline comes in and whacks Cena with the title. His reaction was the same as everybody's at home. This gave enough time for Booker to capitalize and use the world title as a weapon to retain it. That's the match. That K-Fed guy is just so damn unlikable. Also, had this match happened in December, we would have seen a triple threat between Cena, Lashley, and Batista, which might have been cooler to see. Depends. Obviously, 2006 me would have loved that match, so yeah. The next night on Raw, the little heat magnet appeared live via satellite. Why did he appear? First, to promote his Playing With Fire album, which I warn you not to play because your device will catch fire. Also, sold 23,000 copies. Second, he was out to challenge John Cena to a match in Miami on the first Raw of 2007. As for Cena's actual next challenger for the title, well, later that night, Maria was forced to face Umaga per order of Eric Bischoff, who was running Raw for one night. Umaga basically destroyed her, and the superhero John Cena ran in there to prevent further damage. The fans loudly chanted, Cena, Cena, which is funny to hear in hindsight. He once again lashed out on Todd Grisham by F-U-ing him. He told Bischoff who gave him the night off, back off, jack off, or something like that, and he issued a challenge to Umaga if he sees fit. The champ shifted his focus to K-Fed and suggested that he will take that 300 million he stole from Brittany and buy him a military. Like, I recommend you buy a military. I recommend you buy an Air Force because that's the only way he's going to be able to stand by the end of January 1st. Now that challenge Cena set out to Umaga was accepted and the match was made for the November 13th episode. For context, Umaga at this point was the most protected WWE star. It wasn't John Cena, it wasn't Triple H, it wasn't Batista that was protected, but it was the Samoan Bulldozer. The match itself, not much happened and they continued to protect him when the Big Show ran in there to cause the DQ. The two monsters jumped the champ and left him a battered man. Now, while was Big Show out there? Oh, he was there because he was set to captain a Survivor Series team featuring Umaga, MVP, Testin Finley against John Cena's team featuring Rob Van Dam, Sabu, Kane, and Bobby Lashley. This match, like, I don't hear much about it. I don't think it's that great. For some reason, I like it. Wasn't even that memorable or must-see, but I enjoyed it. I believe the interactions between Cena and Umaga were limited. He got eliminated in the first minutes, and this visual showed just how wild Umaga was. Cena and Lashley managed to last to the end, and the duo worked as a team to knock down Big Show. They did just that, and Cena hit the FU on him to win the match for his team. Big Shaw at this point was elsewhere. He was absolutely burned out and needed a break to get back in form. I mean, the guy hadn't taken a break in like two years at this point. And he's a big man. He's wrestling every day in different cities, different states, different countries. He deserved a break. That's one thing for sure. After Survivor Series, a match was made for New Year's Revolution between John Cena and Umaga 
for the WWE Championship. Before the match though, the coach forced Cena to partake in the Master Lock Challenge. Why did he do this? Well, he ain't Cena. It's as simple as that. The champ though insulted a coach's decision making, calling him boring. So what did he do? He booked Cena in the Master Lock Challenge for the title. So now Cena shuts his mouth. I mean, you're all complaining. Oh, you're boring. Well, yeah, what's coming to him? Now, at this point, the Master Lock was still one of the most feared finishers in WWE. That's one thing for sure. It was a worldwide phenomenon with kids all over the world inspired to lock that thing in at schoolyards, playgrounds, inside of school. Doesn't matter. The hold, basically for context, had yet to be broken. See, not once he was locked in the hold, he was turning red. Masters' fingers were starting to part ways when the ref got knocked down. Cena then reversed the hold and forced him to tap out. So Chris's hold had yet to be broken. Umaga craving some action, marched down to the ring, and a brawl ensued. The fight, it was wild. Security, loads of security, failed to separate them on a couple of occasions, and since those two were itching to kill each other, not fight each other, the coach initiated a no-touch policy for both men until the end of the year. Cena instead focused on Estrada and revealed that he's been bragging about essentially running Raw with Jonathan Coachman being in his pocket, you know. So the interim GM booked a match between Armando, Alejandro, Estrada, and John. He got his ass whooped, but Johnny Nitro, k sidekick, kicked the champ's head off. He got his ass kicked by the end of the night too, so yeah. Meanwhile on SmackDown, Batista was asked to find a partner for the Armageddon main event against King Booker and Finley. The World Heavyweight Champion decided to call a familiar friend. John Cena. Now the match was a way to pop the buy rate per the dirt sheets, as WWE had a horrendous December to this member and wanted to have a superb pay-per-view two weeks later to regain the fans' faith, I guess. Cena was brought in to help with a buy rate, and the main event, it did feel like a TV match, but it was still decent enough. I have fond memories of this pay-per-view as I had the DVD and watched it like a million times back in 2007, I mean, I always loved to see Cena on SmackDown around this time period. Hell, I loved seeing anyone that was from Raw on SmackDown. As expected, Cena and Batista won the match and they focused on their next challengers. Cena's though wasn't Umaga, it was the winner of the Battle Royal, Edge. He managed to finagle his way into a title match with John Cena, and about the match itself, it was pretty competitive. The Rated R Superstar was mostly in control, but near the end they went back and forth when the ref got knocked down. Randy Orton decides to run in there and hit an RKO, but DX, I don't know why they're coming out there, decided to cancel this. Like, they ruined, they crashed the party for Rated RKO, and Triple H pedigreed Edge thereby costing him that title for a second time. Leave him alone. Hayfed, meanwhile, was bragging about 2007 and how he's gonna beat John Cena. Funny enough, Johnny Nitro was the one who was training him. He wanted some and he was gonna get some. About that match, first of all, WWE made it seem like a pay-per-view match. I mean, look at this promo, this video package. They made it seem like a big-ass deal. The story between Cena and Hayfed did generate some publicity. I mean, WWE loves these things. So, it was kind of necessary for them to do the match, I guess. Also, another thing to mention is that Hayfed... WWE considered hiring him. I just wanted to mention that. Now the match itself, it kicked off 2007, which I find funny. Hayfed had a big ass ego as evident, and this image in itself is kind of hilarious. The Halloween guys stalled the match for a bit, and then it was on. There was a headlock, a master lock challenge, and it was a joke in Cena's eyes, but that would all change when Umaga interfered and attacked him. Kevin Federline then ran in there and covered Cena. One, two, three. What? Definitely one of the most obscure victories in WWE history. I mean... The one thing I find even funnier was the fact that Cena couldn't get his victory back because the guy, because the other guy ran off to Hollywood. The only way Cena could beat him at this moment is for the 24-7 title, that's all. I mean, back then, every time someone beat Cena, eventually they'd have to lose to him. This time around, that wasn't the case. Now, in my opinion, Federline could have been a great manager. I mean, he was so damn unlikable. There's not a quality trait in there for me to say. What I mean by that is that he ain't a good person in storyline. Maybe the guy is cool in real life, but his album was absolutely trash. He was hated in Hollywood and he was practically claimed to be someone he wasn't. Like, that guy was thinking he's this big A-list star, yet his album sold like 20k copies the first week. Like, that's trash. That's horrendous. He was claiming that he was someone everybody follows. He was claiming he was a trendsetter, which I find funny because I don't see no trends of his to this day. I don't see no trends of his in 2007 at all. Yeah, he could have been great. I also found out he was paid 15k per appearance, so there's that. So the KFED arc is over, now it's time to focus on Umaga. Now the title match with Umaga, first of all, I don't hear about it that often. It's usually overshadowed by that bloodbath between Rated RK and DX. 
Also, it is rightfully overshadowed by their future matchup. Umaga was this unstoppable monster that easily plowed through Cena. The champion had to rely on his instincts, and when he had a burst of energy and momentum, Umaga silences him. The challenger had the match won, but Cena, at a moment's notice, evaded the finisher, and with a little luck on his side, went for a cradle, catching Umaga off guard for the three count. JR's reasoning for the loss was that Umaga did his homework. He prepared for the FU, but not a damn roll-up. Cena did what it takes to get the W, and so he was the first person to best Umaga in a match. The next night on Raw, he reflected on the title victory. Cena spoke about getting his ass whooped at the pay-per-view, and he also took issue at Estrada's statement after the show on how his victory was a fluke. So, he was ready to defend the title tonight. The coach came out, refused to book the match, instead opting to give Umaga the night off. Cena was expecting Umaga to come out regardless of the same it, but coach booked him in a match against Raw's newest acquisition, the Great Khali. Damn, back then when I was watching WWE, this guy was the scariest. It'd be an understatement to say he's 99 overall during this time period as he only lost once, and this loss was to The Undertaker, and little me thought he was the scariest guy ever. Anyway, Cena was destroyed. He didn't lose though because Umaga, like a crazed fan, ran into the ring and picked up the pieces. So a match was made between the two for the Royal Rumble and it was last man standing. Heading into the event, Cena was exactly 100%. The coach was against him, Umaga was breathing down his neck, and his ribs were killing him. The match though, hot damn, I think it has a claim in being Cena's best match up to this point. It was definitely Umaga's best. You know, I hate ranking matches, but this, it's perfect. Such a brutal affair, but that's just an understatement. There's not a bad thing I could say about this at all. Cena had to go through a monster in a very unique fashion. It wasn't a run-of-the-mill big guy versus little guy match. Cena actually had to think with his mind in order to best him. That's why I love this damn thing. His ribs were causing him to wince in pain, and I think this was the first match where many acknowledged that Cena was a good or great worker. At some point, Umaga seemed invincible. He gets up. He gets knocked down. Get up. Gets knocked down. No exaggeration, but it's up there with the very best good guy versus monster matches. Hell, some even see it as the very best. It was violent. It was intense, violent, dramatic, entertaining, tremendous, legendary stuff. The fans got behind Cena. Not everybody, obviously. And he refused to lay down. The problem with this, though, was the fact that he was hurting himself in the process of doing so because Umaga, he was relentless. Eventually, though, he realized that he's got to think like a monster. Opt for some modern warfare. Estrada, meanwhile, for some reason, removed the turnbuckle from the ropes and gave it to Umaga. This backfired, and Cena ended up choking Umaga with the damn ropes, and like any other human, he required oxygen to breathe. There wasn't any in this situation, and he passed out. For two seconds. Cena did it once again, but this time he got him the well-deserved victory. He went to hell and back, got his ass beat from pillar to post, and the excitement just talking about this match makes me want to watch it again. It was that damn good. It rivals just about any match from WWE in 2007. Maybe even any North American match in 2007, depends. But yes, I suggest you watch it because if you haven't, what the hell are you waiting for? So now that Cena steered past the Samoan bulldozer, it was time to focus on WrestleMania 23. Shawn Michaels, the next night on Raw, believed he was deserving of a title shot, and if The Undertaker chooses either the World Championship or the ECW title, as funny as that sounds, because there was no chance in hell that he was going to do that, Shawn Cena's wide open. The champ decided to confront his potential opponent, and Cena echoed the match into the arena. He thought it was good, but the problem with this was the fact that The Undertaker was the Raw Rumble winner. Edge then interrupted and he had something to say about this. He drew heat from the fans, who showed no love for him at all, and simply put, Edge wanted that WrestleMania title shot. He said that he beat Cena in his words more times than he could count, and HBK blew his shot last night. Randy Orton, Edge's tag team partner, came out. He asked Edge about the number of times he challenged Cena. Well, he, Orton, never even got a fair shot. Basically, Edge challenged Cena like 50 times, while he challenged John Cena zero times. Makes sense. Cena had enough of the baby talk, and he wanted the fight. But the boss via satellite stopped Rated RKO from entering the ring, and he booked a duel in a tag team title match against Shawn Michaels and John Cena for the World Tag Team Championships. Heading into the match, Ric Flair reminded John that Shawn is the type to make an impact. You know, he could catch the champ off guard with a physical statement. As for the match, it went in the babyface's side. They had to fight for it though, and so they were champions. As expected, Michaels wanted to make a statement, but Cena had eyes in the back of his head. He repeatedly asked if it was about this, you know, the title, when The Undertaker made his presence felt. Cena pissed his pants in fear, and on SmackDown that week, he made an appearance. The champ wanted an answer from The Undertaker, but that didn't happen because Shawn Michaels made a very rare appearance, and it was weird back then, and still is, to see Shawn Michaels on a blue brand on Friday nights. It's just unusual, it feels unnatural, it's like The Undertaker on Raw during the 2000s. He challenged The Undertaker to a match for the WrestleMania title shot, but before he could make a decision, Vince McMahon 
made an appearance. Once again, Vince, two and a half years since his last appearance, I believe, on SmackDown. He didn't give a damn about what Michaels or the fans want, and so he booked a tag team match for No Way Out. Shawn Michaels and John Cena against Batista and The Undertaker. Damn. So it was going to be four former world champions teaming up in what was possibly the biggest SmackDown main event ever. I'm pretty sure there was a bigger one. On Raw, The Undertaker finally made a decision. He chose Batista. By my count, 11 seconds later, exactly, Shawn Michaels came out. He was in a rush to get that title shot, and he realized John Cena didn't have an opponent for WrestleMania, so he was here to help a brother out. But Randy Orton interrupted, and he wanted the title shot for himself. I just thought otherwise, so the boss booked a triple threat number one contenders match for the main event. There wasn't a lack of passion like others for this one, but there was some issues within rated RKO, and Michaels took advantage to win the match. John Cena was right there to confront the number one contender, and they had a little stare down when Batista and The Undertaker reminded the duo not to overlook the No Way Out main event. About that match, it was bigger than any collab from 2007. It was way bigger than anything. Before the match, Cena was certain that he'll fight as hard with Shawn Michaels as he will against him at WrestleMania, and the match itself, four of my favorites at the time going at it. It can't get any better than that. Also, I don't think I liked anyone as much as I did with those four at the time. Yeah, if I had to say my top four favorites, it was those guys for sure, guarantee. Yeah, yeah, it was. Also, I love this match. It wasn't legendary and the action wasn't outstanding, but the fact that these four faced off in a main event, yeah, it's up there for my favorites of the 2000s. I really like the atmosphere and all the LA crowd they were into it. I believe Batista and The Undertaker were working as the good guys. JBL put in a shift due to Michael Cole's voice. And none of the guys faced each other in a very long time, especially Taker and HBK. Nine years. Nine years since their last match. It was enjoyable due to the circumstances. The WrestleMania stories played a crucial part in the result, and despite the fact that the W was essentially under his belt, Batista cost himself and his WrestleMania opponents the match. Why? Because he wanted to send The Undertaker a message. If you want more on that story, check out this video. I thoroughly enjoyed this one. Now, on the road to WrestleMania, there was no distractions for HBK, Shawn Michaels, and the champ, John Cena. Well, scratch that, there actually was. The two men had to actually focus on defending the tag team titles, and not only that, Cena had to look behind his back at every moment for a switch in music. Ran at RKO and instilled paranoia in Cena's mind, they showed him a clip of every partner Michaels turned on, and they were sure that the same thing was going to happen to him before WrestleMania. But, Rated RKO had bigger issues at hand. Sean Eddie Guerrero and Orton and Edge believed the fact that his own partner did it, so he bailed. Randy Orton lost the match, and as for the other two, there was still that competitive fire. Despite the low-key tension, Cena was still focused on making the tag team thing work heading into WrestleMania. He was trying to help HBK during the match, but the challenger refused any help, and so he lost. But when it was time for John's match with Edge later that night, the Rated R Superstar gave one of the most scratched, that was the most unique excuse I've ever heard for not competing in a match. First of all, he brought Eminem. So Edge was ready to fight, but since he was a civil rights activist, he said that Arizona is one of the last states to recognize Martin Luther King Day, and since he's colorblind, he can't perform in front of these bigots. I'm Canadian, I'm colorblind, so I can't perform in front of these bigots! And since Johnny Nitro's great-grandmother is black, he demanded to beat down Cena himself. What the hell? Never. I don't even know what to say about that. Once I heard this, I burst out laughing. It was so damn hilarious. Like, the amount of effort Edge put into an excuse, unlike anyone else. This is the GOAT excuse I've ever seen for not competing in a match. The whole thing ended up being an attack on Cena, and so Shawn Michaels made the save. Or did he? Since Cena said he didn't want help either, he walked away. But he had a change of hearts, and he knocked down Nitro and Mercury. Cena was completely confused over what transpired as Raw went off the air. Seeing as Shawn never explained anything, the champ called out his tag team partner and WrestleMania opponent on the following episode of Raw. He was asking for a fight, I guess. He also took offense to Michaels' promises of keeping his back, and Sean admitted that he wasn't out to win a Good Samaritan award. His intentions were simple. It was the WWE Championship. He then asked the champ, like, why doesn't anyone mention the fact that you might turn on me? They always say Shawn Michaels is gonna strike. Well, what if it's the other way around? Sean was starting to get desperate, and he wanted that one last title reign under the sun, and he was gonna do anything to get just that. Jonathan Coachman came on stacked that deck against the two. He received you suck chance and revealed that a bunch of tag teams contacted McMahon to get a chance to take away the titles. Since he's busy, the coach himself booked a tag team gauntlet match for the titles. And if they manage to get to the third match, it will be inside a steel cage. The duo managed to get through the world's greatest tag team when Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch ran in there. They gave the champs a hard time for a short time when Cena had Murdoch in FU position. Michaels from out of nowhere super kicked the hell out of Trevor, instilling fear into the champs' mind. He was completely shook and tensions rose, but they were forced, well depends on if they wanted it, to coexist. Eminem was the final team and at this point Michaels was spent, but a 60% HBK and John Cena were good enough to grab the win. 
Despite the W, both men weren't exactly jumping in joy. The losing teams attacked and once again they were forced to coexist. Okay, with two weeks remaining until the big match at WrestleMania, both men were set to face former WrestleMania opponents. You know, WrestleMania Rewind. Sean gets Cena's WrestleMania 21 opponent, JBL. And Cena gets Sean's WrestleMania 20 opponent, Chris Benoit. JBL refused to compete and he tried telling Michaels that he's had opportunity after opportunity to kick Cena's head off. And he informed Michaels that he's getting his ass kicked due to this. And he also called him the most egotistical prick he's ever met in his life. He said that deep down inside, maybe, maybe Shawn Michaels can't be John Cena. So he becomes a good guy. He's religious and when it's all said and done, after the loss, the fans are still going to cheer him. Bradshaw wanted to be some sense into HBK, but since he's retired, Shawn offered a rebuttal saying that no mind games is the best kind of mind game. I mean, he's got a point there. He said that he can scare Cena heading into the match and he'll be in over his head. He didn't like anybody telling him what to do and he then super kicked JBL at a moment's notice showing that if he executes the damn thing, it would definitely work. Later that night, Cena faced Chris Benoit. I believe this was the second to last appearance Chris Benoit made on Raw and Cena was eager to get in there and face the former world champion. Funny enough, a little story, uh, this was the first Raw I watched in nearly a year at the time. From there, I don't think I missed a single Raw throughout the year of 2007. It's a good memory. Shawn Michaels provided commentary and it was decent. Shawn almost got knocked down accidentally, obviously, and it added to the ongoing drama. Benoit was aggressive and full throttle, and the match was basically the ultimate test for John Cena. Chris Benoit was probably the very best wrestler in the company. He took the champion to school, but Cena, like Kobe at the time, was very, and I mean very informed. He made Benoit tap out to the STFU, which was probably a shocker. Although the hold was probably the most feared. After the match, HPK once again teased Cena with the sweet chin music, but this time around, Cena was the one who instilled paranoia into HPK's mind. JBL all of a sudden came out and revealed that the World Tag Team Champions will challenge Batista and The Undertaker. So six nights before WrestleMania, we get to see the rematch from No Way Out. Yeah, about that match, it went in Sean and John's favor. Taker ditched Batista and he was left alone with a tandem duo. They even did a double five-knuckle shovel, but then after nearly two months, Shawn Michaels finally caught Cena off guard with a sweet chin music. It was a long time coming. Batista swooped in to get the W for his team, and Shawn teased Cena once more. Now heading into the match at WrestleMania 23, who did the fans think was winning? Well, it was pretty conflicting, but the question that matters is who did they want to win? Well, looking at old forum posts, they were clamoring for Michaels to get it. A bunch hated Cena's guts with a passion, and they wanted nothing more than an HBK victory. Me, personally, I had the John Cena shirt, so you know who I wanted. The atmosphere was somewhat calm. At least that's what it felt like for me, initially. HBK coming out to the DX team was weird. Cena once again had a special entrance. This time, it was a Fast and Furious-esque with a Ford Mustang. And I should know, this was Michaels' fourth WrestleMania main event. I did a match analysis on the main event in this video, so check it out if you want the entire thing. But long story short, a fan streak, not available on the network. The story saw Michaels work as the heel, I believe. Cena had some momentum initially, but Michaels isolated the knee. It seemed like Cena was a wounded animal, you know, he sold it initially, but I guess since he's Superman, it all went away a couple of minutes later. Michaels showed why he is Mr. WrestleMania, and it seemed like once the moment Cena built momentum, it was all gone. The match started to kick into high gear, and man was it awesome. There was a moment where HBK had it, but he just couldn't cover Cena in time. The champ had a moment's notice caught Sean with the STFU, and forced him to tap out. Damn, what a match that was. Sure, John didn't sell the knee that much, but it's up there with my favorite WrestleMania main events. One thing that would have made this match even better is if Michaels hoisted the title in the end. I think it would have enhanced the quality of the match. Nonetheless, pure classic. Afterwards, though, Sean was pretty angry with Cena and it showed. The next night on Raw, John Cena opened up the show at the top of the hour. As expected, he received a mixed reaction. He hoisted the titles in the air when Shawn Michaels interrupted. He acknowledged Cena as the champ before discussing the match. He said that it was about winning and losing nothing else. Cena won and he lost. But, he doesn't like this. Sean was sick and tired of having to come out of the ring and extend his hand to the guys. And lie to himself saying that they were the better man. He was like, this ends tonight. Sean stated that Cena may have won last night, but he wasn't the better man, and it seemed like Michaels was growing impatient with living without the WWE Championship. For four years, he seeked the world title, and every time he comes so damn close, but it's never to be. Cena took offense to this and straight up accepted whatever Michaels was asking for. Sean said that he wasn't busy, so it was going to happen right here, right now. But the coach interrupted. He vetoed the whole thing because Vince refused to book any WWE title match for the night. Coach reminded them that they're the tag team champions, and so they will defend the titles against... Well, they're facing nine other teams in a 20-man battle royal for the title. A bunch of guys from Raw, SmackDown, and ECW participated in the battle royal, and Cena and Sean had to practically hurt themselves to get the work done. But Coach, he wasn't finished. He congratulated the team on their victory for part one 
of the Battle Royal. Then he brought out 10 other teams that were way more experienced together. You know, Jeff Hardy was limping out there, freaking Paul London and Brian Kendrick, and I also find it fascinating how Miz and Nitro teamed up despite being on different brands. They didn't have any type of relationship either. Anyway, Cena and Michaels worked together, although HPK was mostly the one who was racking up eliminations, but all of a sudden, he tosses his own partner Cena over the top rope, effectively ending the title reign. Cena was like, <laughs> you want it that way? Fine. The Hardys ended up winning, and don't worry, I will cover their runs. Later that night, Todd Grisham asked the million dollar question. Why? Michaels' reasoning was that the title was a distraction, and now his focus is 100% on the WWE title. Randy Orton, however, interrupted and demanded a title shot himself, stating HBK already blew his chance. Meanwhile, a battered edge came out to the arena, and he said that a lesser man wouldn't be standing here tonight because of the Jeff Hardy incident. Despite being sore and fighting to get out of bed into the arena, he heard about Shawn Michaels getting granted a title shot, he heard about his old tag partner Randy wanting a title shot, and the fact that Cena's still the champ, well, Edge thought this was funny. He said that Shawn was the same guy whose head's been bashed in, Randy was the gullible, egotistical man that's been outsmarted several times, and John Cena, he's the guy that went through challenger after challenger, but he's also the same guy that the Rated R Superstar beat. Simply put, he put his name in the WWE Championship picture. He believed he was the best, and so all of the fans will be forced to call him the next WWE Champion. Unfortunately for Edge, he wasn't featured in a number one contenders match the following week. It was between Randy Orton and Shawn Michaels. As HBK and Orton were killing each other, Edge decided to make his presence felt. Randy didn't want any help from Edge, and so he got speared. He got a switch in music about a minute later, and so HBK won. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I see. Edge was totally confused initially, but he was stoked about the results. Why? Well, later that night, he decides to host the Cutting Edge. He believed that both Michaels and Orton lost that match. He then revealed that the coach believes he should be the number one contender, and all of a sudden, a very angry Randy Orton interrupted. Then he delivered a bombshell. Not only does the coach agree that Edge doesn't deserve the title shot, but he's the one who's facing Cena at Backlash. Then, a banged-up Shawn Michaels appeared. HBK wanted to let those two know that he was the better man at WrestleMania, and at Backlash, it needs to be the WrestleMania rematch. And then the champ came out. Cena brought sarcasm to the discussion and took slight jabs at the contenders. He told Edge that the last time they faced off, it was his own match, but if he really wants it, sure. Randy Orton, he's to blame for not getting a title shot. He wasn't man enough to step up. And Shawn Michaels, you want some, come get some. Then the coach tried to make something out of this mess. Since Edge and Orton were respectful to him, he bulked both of them in a two-on-one handicap match. All of a sudden, Cena's complaining, and Mick Foley decided to make a very rare appearance. He informed coach that the decision is not his... He can't make the big decision of the night. That goes to honorary general manager of Raw from the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Michael Payne. He overruled Coach's decision and instead booked John Cena versus Randy Orton versus Edge versus Shawn Michaels for the WWE Championship. Shawn ended up being the happiest camper of them all. He finally gets to right the biggest wrong of 2007. Heading into Backlash, the champ was scheduled to face Randy Orton and Edge in a handicap match in Italy. He beat them as expected, but he obviously broke a sweat. And the reason why he won was because of the issues within Raid RKO. Michaels got FU'd then and there, but the next week, ho ho ho, damn. On the April 23rd, 2007 episode of Raw, John Cena faced Shawn Michaels in a WrestleMania rematch. Now, I remember watching this live personally. It's a weird memory, but my young self thought Raw ended early. It felt like a one-hour episode to me. The guys faced off around 10 o'clock Eastern. Not only that, but there was still an Edge and Orange main event being promoted. So many expected this to last like 10 minutes, excluding commercials, right? Well, they went at it for 55 freaking minutes. The match was probably my favorite of 2007. It has to be. It's really one of the best Raw matches ever, and for me, it's one of my top two. The pace picked up gradually. I watched it again about two years ago, and it was definitely worth the time. For sure, much better than the WrestleMania match. They righted the wrongs here and managed to entertain the London crowd. Tremendous story, tremendous match. So much happened in here that I was kind of left wanting more. I mean, it was sweet. Had they got 120 minutes, don't matter. We wouldn't get boring. And the fact that HBK won clean, damn. First guy to beat Cena decisively in about three years. Now about the fatal four-way match at Backlash, oh, damn, 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 up to that point, it was the greatest fatal four-way match ever, no doubt about it. Still might be, but one thing that's for sure is that it's my favorite ever. High drama throughout the match, you didn't know if Edge was gonna steal it, was Cena gonna keep the title, or was he... <laughs> I don't think anybody thought he was winning, and Sean, was it his night? 
Hotlanta was in for a classic. A bunch of stuff occurred throughout the match. Rated RKO worked as a unit, turned on each other, obviously. It was really intense, and it felt like one of the last matches of its kind. You know, those wild attitude era ruthless aggression matches. I don't know how in the hell they topped that last man standing match, but they did. At some points, it seemed like Michaels' his night, he was kicking ass and taking names. There was this moment, and those final moments were something out of a movie. RKO, Impaler, DDT, and Execution. Orin gets speared. Seating gets the FU on edge, and Michaels from out of nowhere hits the sweet chin music. The fans were cheering, and I feel bad just mentioning this because he's finally got it. They realize, you know, the title's coming home. But Cena lands on Orin. The ref realizes this and counts one, two, three. Damn it. HVK was one second away from championship glory. This time, though, it wasn't his wrongdoing. It was the better man once again, and he let Cena know it. I mean, the fans were certainly clamoring for it. The moment the kick connected, oh man, it gets me sad. And I was the biggest Cena fan in 2007, like, just thinking about it. Overall, an epic match that would have been even better had it ended in a title change, but it didn't matter. The next night on Raw, John Cena had a little moment with Prison Mike. Shawn Michaels swooped in and demanded a rematch. Vince, however, vetoed the whole thing and instead made Shawn earn his way to a title match. Unfortunately for him later that night, he was found unconscious in the back. Coach was confused and he placed the blame on Cena who took offense. Then a couple of minutes later, Edge is dead. He's knocked down. Coach thought it was Orton, but he was found knocked down in the shower too. The interim GM believed somebody was out to destroy all the top guys. But Vince, though, he figured it out. The guy who did it wants Cena. He suggested the champ call out the perpetrator, and that's exactly what he did. So the champ was here. Cena was well aware of these attacks, and he believed somebody wanted attention, and he straight up informed them that he doesn't back down from any challenge, and if they want some, they can get some. He was ready for a fight, and the man didn't appear until about a minute later. And when he came out, he was anything but a coward. It was the great... Kali. Cena's bounced off the ropes and despite this he tried fighting back unsuccessfully. The fans loudly chanted Cena, Cena and the commentary team were terrified. Cena at one point nearly got the FU but Kali elbowed the living daylights out of him and hit the double barrel choke slam to end Raw on top. Now at this point, for me, Kali was the scariest wrestler in the entire company. I was completely perplexed as to how Cena was going to beat him. But, before Kali could get a chance at the champ, he's got to go through Shawn Michaels. HBK managed to get a watchable match out of Kali. Seriously, like, despite the slim chances, Michaels fought with everything to get the chance at John Cena. But Kali beat him senselessly to get the title shot. The ref rang the bell to give Kali the win, and meanwhile, Cena was claiming he wasn't afraid. Later that night, Kali made his presence felt once again. He stole Cena's title for no reason. He's walking without a worry in the world, and once Cena just puts a little finger on him, boom, he blasts him. On the final Raw before Judgment Day, John Cena addressed the events of last week. As expected, he came out without the title, which seems weird to see. And it was like somebody died. That's what Cena's morale was. He believed that last week was pure humiliation, and sure, he's been embarrassed, but this is different. Kali stole his title like a thief in the night. Maybe he can make a bunch of excuses, but that's not him. And what angered the champ the most is that even if he gives his best shot, it doesn't even phase the giant. But if he's in the right frame of mind, he can be a one-man wrecking crew. Suddenly, Cena had a burst of energy and decided to call out the big bad monster, the Grey Kali. He wanted his title back that instant. The faux champion appeared via Titan Tron, and I do not understand a single thing, obviously. There he is. Big Kali managed to get a translator with the main event money he's been making recently. He got Ranjin Singh. He shot in some stuff here. Singh said that Kali claimed he's winning the title, and he asked Cena to just bring it. Champ went and got some. Problem was... Nothing was accomplished with this brawl. Cena got himself hurt before the Judgment Day match, and he basically gave Kali an even bigger advantage. About the match, like I said, Kali had a 99% chance of winning in my mind. The quality of the match, though, I'll get into it right now. It was watchable, which in great Kali terms means it was four stars. If it was John Cena of 06 or 09, I don't think it would have been as good as it was. Also, imagine you showed this picture to someone in 2006. They would have gone absolutely crazy. Anyway, Cena sold to make Kali look like the scariest giant. He was bounced around the mat, and whenever he was on the offense, Kali brought him back to earth. And what was that? Did RVD enter Kali's body or what? The crowd was certainly into this. The champ had to work smarter, not stronger than before. This got him a crucial opportunity to lock in the STFU. The giant couldn't break the hold, and so he tapped out. Damn, it wasn't even the best match on the card, but it was certainly the most engaging. The champ went to hell and back in order to get a watchable match out of Kali. The match didn't even last that long in itself, which I should know is for good reason. The great Kali's ring prowess was horrible, but I think it was on purpose in order to tell the next story. The next night on Raw, the great Kali had a complaint about the match at Judgment Day. His words as translated by Ranjin Singh were that he was cheated last night. He never submitted in his life and he knew his foot was under the rope the entire time. And in essence, 
the referee screwed the Grey Kali. The fans, and most importantly, John Cena screwed him also. Singh also mentioned Cena's dubious tactics, such as using the steel steps to his advantage. Kali also said that Cena's a coward, and it was then where John Cena interrupted. Oh look, it's the return of Jorts. The champ admitted that Kali's foot was under the rope, but he also made the Grey Kali tap out. As expected, he took offense to the word coward, and the champ admitted that he did fear Kali initially. In judgment, it wasn't even about winning or losing to him, it was about surviving, but he not only survived, but he beat Kali. He straight up told him that he can beat him anywhere in the building. He asked Kali, do you want a rematch? To which Champ responded to himself stating that he wants a rematch. They fought. Kali stood tall easily unlike the previous night and shortly thereafter a false count anywhere match was made between John Cena and the great Kali for the WWE Championship at one night stand. Heading into the match, Cena reassured everyone that he is not afraid of the great Kali. He mocked them, the fans booed, chanted you suck as Cena was rambling on. By the way, it was the Toronto crowd. He gave the doubters his word. He can and he will beat Kali. Before the title match, however, the champ had to go one-on-one -on -one with the great Kali in a non-title match on Saturday night's main event. This match went way differently than you'd expect it to be. He got his ass whooped plain and simple, and he lost clean. After the match, Ranjan Singh proclaimed the great Kali as the next WWE Champion. As for one night stand, I believe it was better than it had any right to be. The false count anywhere stipulation offered more freedom, and again, Cena sold his ass off. He made every blow seem like hell. It was slow. It wasn't a catch as catch can style main event match that we're accustomed to. I think Cena got in way less offense this time around, and the FU was the vital move in order to end Kali, but it took the champ a while. The challenger was manhandling the champion around the stage area, but at a moment's notice, Cena caught Kali, not really, and hit an FU off the damn crane. That got him the win at 10 minutes. They were scared of giving Kali long matches and rightfully so. There's only so much you can do in the ring around this time period. You're probably thinking the feud's over, right? Wrong. The next night on Raw, Vince McMahon, who was on something, I swear, believed that John Cena was out to humiliate him. This was after the ECW title loss. That's a whole other story, but this segment was awkward in the best way possible. Vin Man wanted to punish Cena for mentioning the title loss by forcing him to defend his title in a triple threat match against Umaga and the Great Kali. What I think many expected was a Vince and Cena feud because it seemed like they were implying it. Also, when I hear John Cena vs. Great Kali vs. Umaga, it sounds like one of those matches that have like a bunch of views on YouTube, you know, millions and millions. Anyways, the champ was very informed. Kali fell so damn hard during this match. Man. Umaga, he didn't even take the pin even though he was weaker than Kali during this time period. He was made to look stronger. So now that the Umaga thing was finally done, you know, the Kali and Umaga thing was finally done, who was John Cena's next opponent going to be? Well, for starters, I think, and this is what I've seen, I think it would have been Shawn Michaels had he never suffered any injury. I mean, they were only delaying the match. They wanted to finish the trilogy, the story in itself. My personal opinion is that had they went through with it, Shawn would have won the title. My reasoning is that Orton was pushed back due to the fact that he destroyed a hotel in Europe, so they waited to see if Randy would get serious. In the meantime, they built him up. So yeah, that's what I think, and I assume he would have feuded with AJBK. With that said, the next feud for Cena was apparently going to be Snitsky as the dirt sheets reported. That explains the vignettes airing on Raw for a couple of weeks during this time period. He was drafted to Raw from ECW, and it seemed like that's where they were heading, but it wasn't to be. So who was Cena's next challenger? With Mr. McMahon's storyline death sending shockwaves throughout the WWE, there wasn't much thought put into Cena's opponent. Mick Foley said he wants to get a title shot. Randy Orton accused Foley of possibly being involved in the boss's demise. King Booker made his first official appearance as a member of Raw. He didn't accuse Foley, but Bobby Lashley did. He interrupted and shoved the King right out of the ring, and then the champ came out. He didn't like this Law & Order investigation. The champ thought it would be dumb to think any of them were the culprits because they only see him once a week. He began rhyming about who it could be, and in his words, anybody. The coach then interrupted, and he said that Mr. McMahon would have liked for the show to have gone on, and so the family put him in charge on an interim basis. He announced the championship challenge match featuring every single one of those guys for Vengeance of Night of Champions. Now, the match itself didn't really have much of a buildup because the event was only six days away. Orton stood tall later that night teasing what's to come, and that's all. Also, the title match was randomly announced on draft night. Now about the match, there's a reason why it's not mentioned that much. Chris Benoit did what he did that weekend, and June 24th was the day where he ended it all. Add to the fact that the theme song for the event was called Gone, yeah, it's not going to be mentioned all that much. The main event itself was a car crash. No, not in a bad way. You had the uncrowned champion, the king, the hardcore legend, the legend killer, and the champ. It was definitely unique from a sense of participants. Like Mick Foley, Bobby Lashley in one match... Just sounds like a randomizer from SmackDown vs. Raw or something. But yes, if you got 10 minutes, watch this match. It easily pumped my blood last time around. It felt like it was always in high gear. Not a moment of dull action. They gave us a little preview of Cena Lashley. Mick Foley was still taking bumps in the year of 2007. 
Cena FU'd Lashley. Damn, it was fun. The crowd was behind every move. It was so damn exciting, and Cena just found himself at the right place at the right time. Everyone was down, and so he quickly took advantage. If you don't really think of the events that went on, and you're just bored, watch it, please. As expected, Cena didn't appear on Raw the next night, but he did appear on ECW Tuesday night in order to give the fans a little good time. I never understood this appearance then, but obviously I can see why now. He faced the new ECW champion Johnny Nitro in a competitive match. It wasn't bad, and as expected, the WWE champion won. Now it's on to Cena's next challenger. On the July 2nd, 2007 episode of Raw, four men, Mr. Kennedy, King Booker, Bobby Lashley, and Randy Orton were set to compete in the Beat the Clock tournament. All of them wanted a title shot, especially Randy Orton, who was craving it the most. Lashley's reasoning for a title shot, he never lost his world title, therefore he's an uncrowned champion. They were all complaining, so William Regal randomly came out. The reason why he was out here was because Coach was on holiday, and he booked the Beat the Clock Challenge. King Booker was complaining the entire time during the segment, and the winner gets Cena for the title at the Great American Bash. Orton set the time at 7 minutes and 6 seconds by beating Jeff Hardy, but his time was easily shattered by King Booker, who beat Val Venus, which is sort of unfair. Meanwhile, Mr. Kennedy was very sure of himself, you know, I'm going to win the challenge and beat Cena, and his opponent was super crazy. He wasted too much time talking on the mic in this costume, because Super Crazy ended up rolling him up to win. If it was regular beat the clock rules, he would have been number one contender, but that wasn't the case. Lashley's opponent ended up being Shelton, and he beat him with 25 seconds left, which destroyed Booker in the back. He was raging. At the end of the night, William Regal hosted the contract signing for the Great American Badge main event between John Cena and Bobby Lashley. The champ praised Lashley, and he was looking forward to the match, and... The challenger also had the same thoughts, and so he signed the contract. All of a sudden, Mr. Kennedy and King Booker came on. This felt like some sort of season mode cutscene. Both guys thought this was a farce, it was rigged, yada yada yada, and Cena told them that if they want some, they can get some in a fight ensued. The heels didn't put up much of a fight, and the champ signed the contract. Once he turned around, BAM! He was speared. And no, this wasn't a heel turn. It was just Bobby Lashley showing that he wants the title. The next week, Cena wasn't physically on Raw. He appeared on Larry King Live with Chris Jericho and Bret Hart to discuss the Benoit tragedy. He spoke to JR and Jerry Lawler about the main event at the bash, and they asked Cena, like, how can you beat a man that's physically and mentally strong as Bobby Lashley? He answered in, like, basic sports fashion. We'll see. I'm looking forward, you know. Lashley, meanwhile, beat both Booker and Kennedy in a handicap match. Heading into the bout, the WWE treated it like a WrestleMania main event. They asked the best and present on their thoughts of the main event match. Flair chose Cena, Edge chose Cena, Batista opted for Lashley due to his power, strength, and athletic ability, and even Stone Cold Steve Austin made a prediction. It really complimented the match greatly, giving it this spectacular finals feeling. On the final row before Great American Bash, Jonathan Coachman hosted a debate between the champion and the uncrowned champion. The coach gave the champ a little flashback to two weeks earlier and asked the question, do you feel like your championship reign will end this Sunday? Because, well, Cena's never faced anyone with this ridiculous combination of power, speed, agility, and strength that Lashley possesses. He began fake crying about how he can't win this match and it greatly irritated Lashley. The champ thought this was the worst question ever and told his opponent that despite his skill set, he's faced the toughest and baddest of them all and he promised Lashley that he'll get the best of John Cena. Coach then asked Lashley what kind of message he was sending to Cena when he speared him, and he was like, actions speak louder than words. He opted to have the hype man discuss the match while he's standing there ready to fight. Cena obliged and wanted a fight, but Coach quickly put a stop to it before Lashley ran up to him. He threatened to cancel the title match if he even lays a single finger on him, and Cena told Lashley not to be concerned about Jonathan Coachman. Instead, he should focus on his greatest opportunity, because if he doesn't, he's going to exit the arena without a title once again. Security and officials tried to prevent the situation from boiling over, but then Cena listed a bunch of his accolades. Cena then said that at the Great American Bash, he will put Lashley's invincibility to the test, and now he came again. Cena wasn't backing down, and they went face to face. The situation escalated, and John once again promised his best as Raw went off the air. Now, the match at the bash was something. Say what you want about Cena, like or dislike, but you can't deny this match was some of his best work up to this point. This match had a certain aura to it, you know. Two young guys main event in a pay-per-view is something that didn't really happen all that often. Still doesn't to this day. Lashley was in his 20s, Cena was in his 20s also, and it was like the first match in the beginning of a Lashley-Cena story. We didn't know what happened afterwards, but at the time, it was something. Like, these guys were going to be the two biggest faces of WWE. Cena took control and led Lashley to a classic. Also, I'm not going to lie, but this was definitely Lashley's best match up to this point. It featured action, drama, and it might have had an element of unpredictability because, well, Cena was champion for 10 months, and Lashley was the guy who had the hardest push in 07. The crowd was into it, near falls, some tremendous stuff, and Lashley had to take an avalanche FU to lose this one. It wasn't like he was buried. He actually looked good in defeat. But since Lashley lost, it meant Cena went through everybody. 
I saw the dirt sheets once again. There was a plan that saw Lashley turn into a villain, a heel, and face Cena at SummerSlam, but that wasn't what they went with. Since Lashley lost, it meant Cena went through everybody. The Raw roster was sort of thin, and so this left one person whose star power was big enough for a SummerSlam main event. The next night on Raw, after getting himself and Candice Michelle out of a sticky situation, John Cena was on the receiving end of an RKO. Jonathan Coachman took notice and booked John Cena versus Randy Orton for the WWE Championship at SummerSlam. Finally! If you lived through it, you know how anticipated this match was. It was like Messi and Ronaldo finally clashing. Something like that, like the top two young guys finally facing off. They did wrestle in a TV match, but that doesn't really count because those matches didn't really have a clean finish, and they weren't at their best. Many thought they were saving it for WrestleMania 24, but that wasn't to be. Cena addressed the title match the following week, stating that Orton's well prepared. Well prepared as in making a statement by attacking him, because the last couple of months, every single one of Cena's challengers attacked him to get a title shot. That's what he means. The champ asked Orton to skip to the end of the book to see the ending. You know, at the end of SummerSlam, the champ is here. All of a sudden, Carlito randomly interrupted it and he announced Cena's the first guest on the new and improved Carlito's Cabana. Cena's completely bewildered, and as expected, Caribbean Cool reminded the champ that he won the US title from him in his first match. Cena realized that this was true, but then mentioned that this was a long ass time ago. So basically, last time Carlito had one on Cena, uh, very long time. Kennedy interrupted after Carlito promised to make an impact, therefore getting a title shot. Kennedy disagreed, they argued and bickered over who should really be number one contender, and Cena then shouted Rand Yorin. He believed the legend killer earned his spot unlike someone who believes they're the number one contender by a microphone falling from the ceiling or stuttering on your last name. Cena suggested he prove himself by beating Bobby Lashley. And as for Carlito, sure he beat the champ, but that was a long time ago and in order to prove himself, he's gotta face the champion tonight. Now about that, Carlito failed to prove himself. If by fail, you mean he actually won. That's right. Randy Orton was the cause of this chaos, and an apple face Cena was smiling. Why is he smiling? Well, he's got apple on his face, and he's gonna do something about it. A very joyful Carlito once again hosted his cabana the following week, with his guest being John Cena. He didn't waste time in appearing, and he stared a hole into Carlito, who sort of backed off. All of a sudden, his angry demeanor turned into that of Spongebob's in the morning. He was happy to be there. Why? Because he's gonna host his own cabana. The champ interviewed himself and complained about the events of last week. It was more fitting for Maria, you know. She did stuff like this. Maria, what are you gonna do today? Oh, I'm gonna do this. He gave three reasons why he should trash the cabana and beat up Carlito. One, he ain't got no nuts. Two, he hates spitting apples. And that's cool. I don't even know what the hell he was talking about. I assume when he means that's cool, he's talking about assaulting him? He then assaulted Carlito when Orton ran out there. His snake-like tendencies wouldn't work here and he ran the hell out of there. Carlito received an FU and William Regal came out and informed Mr. Cena that Carlito and Randy Orton have the chance to choose the champ's opponent. Initially, Regal thought it was one of them, but they weren't having any plans on wrestling that night. Instead, they chose Umaga. Obviously, the IC champion was a tough opponent for the champ. I mean... It's clear. The crowd was certainly engaged with the match, and Cena couldn't find a way to FU Umaga. The match itself would conclude when Orin and Carlito interfered and attacked Cena. This was moments before Umaga was probably gonna tap out. He took offense to the chest slaps and attacked. William Regal decided, you know, I have a great idea. It's gonna be Orin and Carlito against John Cena and Umaga. Okay, side note, I wish we got to see a babyface Umaga run. I think it would have been cool. He probably would have been even more successful, you know. He's destroying people, he's not talking, we all know who he is, and all that stuff. I think it would have been cool. As for how that match went, we got to see a little SummerSlam preview. Umaga was basically Hulk Hogan of 2007, which means that he was unstoppable. The team of Cena and Umaga ended up winning, gaining some fire, heading into SummerSlam. That Saturday night's main event, John Cena faced Carlino in a non-title match. He utterly destroyed him, but right afterwards, Orin attacked. He threw Cena into the steps then to make matters worse for the champ, hit an RKO on him right onto the steel chair. So, John wasn't at 100% heading into the match with Orin, let alone the match with Snitsky on Raw. On the final Raw before the events, Orin showed just what he's made of. During Cena's match with Snitsky, the Legend Killer struck with an RKO to cause a DQ. That wasn't enough, and he had a second RKO, and Orin stared at the title, ending Raw on top. Now, from what I could find, the rumor heading into the events was that if the Legend Killer kept his behavior in check, he's winning the gold. As we all know, it was delayed, but yes, Orin was no longer a problem in the back at this point. With that said, the match at SummerSlam was a classic, no doubt about it. It's unfortunate that they never topped this match since. I mean, how do you like create magic like this, yet not be able to duplicate it or replicate it? They did have some better matches, but they always involved some sort of stipulation. This one, it's my favorite. They told such a tremendous story out there. The crowd was lively, and I believe it was going to be Orin's night. It just had this feeling to it. Legend Kill is more about isolation, the slow tempo, methodical pacing. You know, if you've ever watched this seriously, what are you waiting for? It had a big fight feel to it. For four years, fans have been waiting to see a meaningful match between those two, and it didn't disappoint. Not one bit. 
It was a pure four-star match, which by watching their future matches seems a bit unexpected. I rank it in my top five SummerSlam main events. Or a near the end win for the punts, but find himself in FU position to lose the match and his chance at WWE Championship Gold. The next night on Raw, Randy Orton opened the show in a state of disappointment. The fans booed as he stood there motionless for a few seconds. He said that he spent the entire day in church because he witnessed a miracle. John Cena retaining the title. He said that while he was on his knees, he had an epiphany. He had the match won and therefore he should have been the WWE Champion. But... If anything, the guy that needs to thank God is John Cena himself for surviving the challenge. He said that he also needs to thank God for his career not ending, and due to the results, Orn demanded a rematch. It didn't take long for the champion to appear. Just to know this episode emanated from Boston, Cena's father was in attendance, and this gave Orin a little idea. The champ thought Orin was a baby complaining about the title loss and whatnot, and he did praise Orin for kicking his ass for weeks, but he was more in the business of making fun of him. And with the title loss, Randy moves to the back of the line. Cena's mind frame at this point was more focused on a certain game. That match wasn't booked, however, because Regal refused to grant Triple H a title match. Instead, Cena was going to face King Booker. Orin tried to make another statement, but was unsuccessful. Later that night, the Viper barged into Mr. McMahon's office and demanded the rematch with John Cena. Unfortunately for him, the boss thought he was undeserving of a title shot, not until he actually shows that he really wants the title shot. But until then, it was a blunt no. At the end of the night, Randy Orton interfered in John's match with King Booker, which was his final appearance, I should know. He got double teamed and never found a way to fight back. The Legend Killer attempted a punt, but had second thoughts. Instead, he went after John Cena's father, and he was damned if he does, but he did it anyways and kicked his lights out. JR was utterly shocked, and the medical team attended to John Cena Sr. as Raw went off the air. The following week, Orton decided to refrain from appearing in the ring, so he appeared via satellite to address the events of last week. Funny enough, it was actually Regal who told him to stay away from the building. Orton didn't care if anyone thought he was deranged, and if anything, Cena was to blame for all of this. He said that he could have prevented it from happening had he accepted the title shot in the first place. Orton knew that Cena wanted the rematch, and William Regal made the match official for Unforgiven. John Cena versus Randy Orton for the WWE Championship. His final words were that he wishes Cena's father never forgives his son for what happened last week. Then the leader of C Nation appeared. He had this disappointed look on his face and decided to let out all that aggression onto the Raw general manager, William Regal. On the final Raw before Unforgiven, the interim general manager, Jonathan Coachman, managed to ban John Cena from the building. Randy Orton took advantage of this, and he had a few words to say about the upcoming WWE Championship match. Orton reminded everybody that at Unforgiven, it will be one year since the champ became champ. And he also said that in Cena's past title defenses, it wasn't personal. This time, though, it was different. The Legend Killer was very sure that he got into the champion's head, and he was confident that the title was coming home this Sunday. All of a sudden, Cena sprinted right into the ring. They kind of brawled, but security pulled Cena away. The coach was getting an earful from Vince, and the champ with security by his side told the boss that as a man, he knows exactly what he, John, will do to Randy Orton at Unforgiven. He was almost reduced to tears in delivering the statement. As for their match at Unforgiven, it was pretty disappointing. Compared to their match at SummerSlam, you'd think it was two different athletes that were out there. I think the belief was Orton's winning the gold. Kind of made sense, but I think since the match didn't main event, the expectations were something else. John Cena's father was in attendance for this one, and anyways, it just didn't click at all. I do have fond memories of this entire pay-per-view, though, but I can acknowledge that it was pretty bad. Add to the fact that it ended in a DQ, yeah, it was underwhelming. Orton dragged Cena's father out of the crowd, only to get his ass kicked, and funny enough, Cena Sr. actually punted Orton, which was pretty hilarious. So this match was just to advance the story. Right afterwards, the coach was shouting at Cena Sr. and announced another rematch. This time, it will be a last man standing match. The Cenas were all proud and happy, but that would take a turn the next night in Nashville. As expected, John Cena opened the show with a little promo. Cena felt fabulous, the fans booted, and he said that a weight was lifted off his shoulders. He said that he felt good about the DQ loss from last night, and sure, he lost to Orton, but he was eager to face him in the last man standing match. The coach, though, turned that smile upside down when he booked Cena's father in a match against Randy Orton. Initially, Coach was going to just strip him of the title, but Senior came to terms. As for that match, well, let's just say it was the final time we saw Cena Senior in a while. John had to watch his father suffer, and Orton was taking his time slowly. It was a methodical Orton beatdown. We all know how those go. The damage was already done. Cue the No Mercy song because Cena was ready to straight up destroy Orton at the pay-per-view. The next week, Jonathan Coachman announced that he suspended Randy Orton indefinitely. Now, the reason why this was done was because Orton was getting married that week. He did appear on the Titan Tron, though, to congratulate John Cena on being the biggest phony in WWE history. He thought John deliberately got himself disqualified, knowing that he couldn't win that match. He did, however, give him credit for making people forget about it so quickly by having Dad punt him or in in the head. Randy Orton thought that Cena Sr. was taking away his way of making a living, trying to kick him, and that's why he enjoyed beating him on Raw the previous week. 
the Viper suggested his opponent bring his father next week so he could show us to come at no mercy, and he proclaimed himself to be the last man standing. Meanwhile, the coach had the choice of stripping Cena of the gold per Mr. McMahon, and even wished that he was the one who was in the ring with Mr. Cena last week. So basically, the title reign of John Cena's, the title's fate is in the hands of Jonathan Coachman. This was due to his actions, John's actions earlier that night. He put his hands on authority, so the coach is in the ring. He's implying that the longest title reign in nearly 20 years is coming to an end, and he called out Cena. Basically, what he wanted was for the champion to beg and plead to keep his title, and even then he still might strip him of the gold. Cena didn't utter a single word, and instead was looking for a fight. Now, for some reason, a referee informed Lillian Garcia some very special information. She announced a tables match between Cena and the coach. This was per Mr. McMahon. So, he wasn't going to be stripped of the title, and it was on. I swear, this is the most Vince McMahon thing ever. He changed his mind just like that. The match was back and forth, action befitting of a WrestleMania main event, and Cena ended up FUing him through the table. On the final Raw before No Mercy, Champion was set to face Mr. Kennedy. Before the match, however, he discussed No Mercy. He knew that everybody had their doubts about him, but he assured everyone that he's going to beat Randy Orton at No Mercy so badly. So badly that the fans won't forget about it. Now, about his match with Mr. Kennedy, other than the fact that it was the first match ever, their first match ever, it wasn't memorable. That is until Cena injured his shoulder. Once they realized it, the match ended abruptly. What did he injure? What did he tear? He tore his right pectoral muscle completely off the bone. Right after the match, Orin RKO'd Cena proving his claim of being in Chicago were lies, and he gave everybody a little preview of No Mercy. Hell, he even RKO'd him on top of the announce table. Now, it's crazy to me how Cena looked past the injury in order to do these spots. Like, it just shows the level of dedication he had to the industry. Orin counted all the way to 10, and unfortunately, this wasn't official. Now... He knew he was injured. They just didn't know how badly it was, and he even said, quote-unquote, no matter how serious the injury is, one way or another, I'll be ready to compete on Sunday. The next night on ECW, Vince McMahon opened the show to address the status of the WWE Championship. He informed everybody that Cena's right pectoral muscle was completely torn, and with his injury, he could be out from six months to a year. Damn. So he announced that John Cena is no longer WWE Champion. The fans booed and Vince didn't want the title to be vacant for so long. He announced the WWE Championship match for No Mercy and he guaranteed a new champion. I believe had Cena appeared at No Mercy, he was going to lose the title. I also heard a rumor that they were going to have Hell in a Cell at Cyber Sunday, but it's kind of doubtful to me because Taker and Batista ended up having it the next month. So who was going to be the next champion? Rumor suggested Orton, YSJ could make his return, but we all know what happened in the end. So that's John Cena's title reign. Honestly, it should have ended in much grander fashion. Imagine if he was injured and came into the ring, took an RKO or whatever. It's a shame. He couldn't compete, although he wanted to. And yeah, like it, it was a very anticlimactic ending to the longest title reign in nearly 20 years. My personal opinion on the title reign is that it was pretty good. Problem was the fact that Cena already held the title two times earlier. They kind of had enough of him, you know. Not everyone, because he had a noticeable like fan base. Me personally, I believe this was his best damn title reign because for one, it was the best set of matches he ever had in his career. Like the awesome stretch he had from January of 07 all the way up to August. One of the best stretches in WWE history for sure, like in a title reign. Every match he had was elite, barring the Kali ones, and he carried the company on his back. Like for good or for bad, they relied on him. So yeah, what did you guys think of this title reign? Please comment down below. And that's it for this video. Make sure you hit an FU on the like button and perhaps the STFU on the subscribe button. Peace, I'm at.